Welcome back to Watchbox. As usual, I'm your host, Tim Masso, and this is Watches Tonight. This evening, we're talking New Year's resolution for the entire watch world. We're chatting live in real time, probably a bit more than usual. And of course, we have your viewer wrist shots. Don't forget the folks who pay for these pixels, open up a different tab, keep me streaming, thewatchbox.com, the best way to buy, trade, or sell pre-owned watches. Especially when you want to buy a watch, we've got more than anyone with over 3,000 pre-owned and vintage watches live right now. My favorites are right there, but I've actually got a fun piece on today. I thought I'd wear a cool piece out of the inventory because I buy watches so infrequently, but this is one that's caught my fancy, and you guys know I'm a longtime fan of HYT. And in case you're wondering, it's just past five o'clock right there, the immiscible barrier between the two fluids, one clear, one green, is the hour, and then there's a minutes register, which is down at the bottom of your screen, so it's also a regulator, and when it reaches the end of its travel, it is a retrograde. It's 48.8 millimeters, but it's also a lugless watch. That's the HYT H0, a very cool piece that came out in 2017. Now, taking a look at our chat box right here, Blue Shirt Buddha, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Sean Brimall from Temple, Texas. We've got Sean P., we've got Wrist Royce, we've got Q Maestro, Wolfgang K., a big fan from the Tim Masso Facebook group, and one of our best contributors, Wolfgang thank you. Also a first time on the show live. Good to have him. Adam Crossfire, Mateo C. And we have right here a comment from Mateo. A shout out for Marco Long, one of the best independent watchmakers in the game. Turkish Meister, our friend in Turkey. Mark S. from Brooklyn. We've got Thomas Burnett joining in. We've got Boss Defender from Bavaria, Germany. Thanks for staying up late with us in continental Europe. And of course we've got Renside, Adam Crossfire. We've got Budik One from Poland, I believe, and I believe you will be in tonight's episode. I got your wrist shot. And guys, remember, wrist shots are a big part of what we do. I asked and you answered. Viewer wrist shots won. Here come five alive. Starting out with Dylan L. and his Rolex Air King time lapse, which is absolutely illuminating and a lovely piece to kick off our evening. Phil impresses with his true vintage Zenith El Primero. A386 caliber 3019 PHL, very cool. Mikhail B of Poland keeps the times with his Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean GMT, a nice wrist shot, proving to me that you can fit it underneath the cuff. Simon H finds weekend wrist time for his Rolex Sea Dweller 4000, looking good, nice classical wrist shot, good light. And Kubelay D logs hours over California with his IWC Pilot Mark 18 and 1979 Balanca Satabria. Very cool, guys. If you want to be on this screen, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Jumping into the box, we've got Andres M joining in from Fort Lauderdale. Dave Opencar, Marcus G making a live stream for the first time in 2021. We've got Miko Stark. We've got Joe Tyson from Apex, North Carolina. Eddie Landsberg, Matt. Foster and Gil Mibson. All right, dudes, let's talk about New Year's resolutions in 2021. This is probably the last show where I can talk about this before it becomes totally passe, so I am going to take my chunk of flesh. Starting with the brands, the people, the places, the things in our industry. And guys, I want to hear in the chat box, what are your watch-wise New Year's resolutions and what New Year's resolutions would you pick for brands, models, people, places, and events in the industry? I'm going to start out with Omega. And this is a big one that many of us share when New Year's rolls around. But for Omega, lose weight and get slim. Get trim. A story of two Seamasters. Right there, you can see one of the deep blacks on my wrist. I'm sorry to say that with girth stretching to 16, 17, even 18 millimeters, a lot of folks are not buying Omega watches, not because the diameter is too large, they've got that under control, and they've got the lug-to-lug -lug span under control, but the thickness is the problem there. So for a lot of folks, Thickness is going to be the problem, especially when comparing current Omegas to older ones. My original Bond era 253180 Seamaster professional diver was about 11 and a half millimeters thick. Add more than two millimeters and you have the current diver 300 meter. What's changed? Well, it got a coaxial movement and a display case back, but that's fine when the whole watch is 13.7 millimeters thick with the diver 300 meter. By the time you get to the planet oceans, by the time you get into the complicated automatic winding speed masters, it starts to become unwieldy. Omega, you have infinite technology from the universe of Swatch Group companies. Please, 
thinner watches. You're a flagship brand. You need to be on par with Rolex this way too because a Submariner is like that. Unfortunately, a Seamaster is like that. Please, give us the choice of thinner sports watches. Now, Rolex. This is tough because Rolex is the brand that does almost everything right. So what do they not do well? Well, they maintain their brand equity, the resale value of their watches. They eschew planned obsolescence. A Rolex from the 50s still looks like a Rolex today. But what they don't do well is explain shortages. And this is where Rolex really needs to double down on better training for dealers. They need to be able to have two conversations. One is explaining the wait lists and the other is better explaining the other models. Follow me here. Folks get angry when they can't buy things immediately. But if you explain that this is Rolex protecting you when the time comes to buy, protecting the after sales value of your watch, the brand equity of the model, the permanent demand for the watch you will originally want and later buy, you finish the cycle once you take delivery. That wait list becomes a strength. The product you own becomes a more desirable, more valuable watch in perpetuity because Rolex protects the supply. The problem becomes people who won't consider anything else and get angry. So what Rolex needs to do, if they can't convince people to get on a wait list, is explain the other models in the cases. And I've seen Yacht Masters still in the case. I've seen non 41 millimeter Oyster Perpetuals that are sitting around. I've seen Sky Dwellers, when people are ready to pay multiples the price of a Daytona. Why can't you explain to them why for $18,000 a steel Sky Dweller is a great choice? Rolex needs to find a way to teach dealers to talk about the other watches. If you can't explain away the anger that some people show when they can't get the watch immediately, you really need to be able to relieve the pressure by showing them something else and explaining its virtues. There are so many Rolex models. Go on the Rolex website. You'll be blown away by how many variants of the Datejust 36 and Datejust 41 exist. And then there are the Sky Dwellers. And then there are going to be the steel Yacht Master 2s. And at the prices people are paying for Submariners, GMTs, and Daytonas right now, those complications are relevant to the discussion. People clearly are willing to spend that kind of money on a Rolex. You just have to be able to explain to them why they should if it's not a model they've recently seen on Instagram. So for Rolex dealers, better and more focused training. I would also say Rolex can relieve the volume shortfalls without overproducing and devaluing the Sub, the GMT, and the Daytona. One way to do that is to teach people how to sell the other models and be exhaustive about that. But another way could be to double down on the production of longtime cult watches and second string stars. Let's talk about a new turnograph. This is something Rolex could really use. Of course, the turnograph, discontinued in 2011, was the late great rotating bezel Rolex Thunderbird, an early sort of pilot's watch that was used by the US Air Force Thunderbird's acrobatic aerobatic demonstration squadron in the 50s. It's a very cool watch with a very cool story, and since these left the market, they've become highly collectible. This would be a good time to bring them back. First, because Rolex is nowhere near maxing out sales of the Datejust 36. So this could be an interesting way to bone up the volume of a model line that sells well, but not breathlessly the way some of the others do. And if you want to offload some of the demand from the sports watches, you're going to need something that's analogous to a sports watch. And the Thunderbird certainly is that. I would also say, do the unprecedented. Create a Rolex turnograph in the Datejust 41 millimeter case. This would be outstanding because now you're talking a true one for one substitute with the wrist presence of a 41 millimeter Submariner or a 40 millimeter GMT or a 40 millimeter Daytona. That highly technical look that people associate with Rolex, but it's not forcing you to make even one more GMT Sub or Daytona. You're opening up a new front if you're Rolex and you're expanding the Datejust line and you're helping to unload some of the weight from the other lists. I would also say a new Milgauss would be very cool. And I would love to see this because the Milgauss was last new for 2007. So the Daytona is obviously the oldest watch in the line. But this is getting up there right now. And I would also say that if it were one of these original Milgauss style designs, the 6541, the 6543, as they debuted back in 1955, with rotating bezel and honeycomb style dial, I guarantee you immediately the Milgauss would become cool again and in demand, and it might pair a few weeks from those Daytona GMT 
and Submariner waitlists. Now, talking a little bit more about how Rolex can help things at the margin, the GMT Master came out in rose gold for the first time ever in 2018. We also saw for the first time a two-tone version of the GMT with steel and rose gold. I believe that there's room to add another Submariner model, maybe two. One that's two-tone and rose, and one that is full rose gold. It won't help a lot with the wait lists, but again, it adds a new product without meaningfully changing the total production. You just move some of the people waiting for the Smurf currently, over to the waiting column for the rose gold model. And I think altogether it would be a cool innovation, even if one that's only a change by degrees. So Rolex, my New Year's resolution for you is better training for dealers to talk about wait lists, to sell the rest of the collection, and a couple of refreshed or all new models to help curb some of the pressure. It's becoming like a teapot tamped down. And I think there are ways, clever ways, to get around that. Viewer wrist shots number two, Roy S. and his wife share their Omega Seamasters, including her Christmas gift, Planet Ocean. She got the midsize, very nice. Guys, don't undersell the virtues of the midsize Planet Ocean. To me, the 39.5 might be the best dive watch Omega currently makes. It's a very nice shot, Roy. Abdul R of Germany hits the winter landscape with his polar dial on a handsomely strapped Rolex Explorer 2. Good shot, very nice. Have you ever noticed that an overcast sky makes for the best wrist shots? Marceau R stuns with his Omega Speedmaster Blue Side of the Moon Aventurine on a gorgeous two-tone custom strap. That right there looks like lizard and it is killer. That is the coolest strap of the night, hands down, or wrists down, I should say. Doug M takes the path less traveled with his Zenith Pilot Type 20 annual calendar, a big and burly El Primero powered annual calendar with a module by Ludwig Oxlin. It does not get any better than that. And John K from Hong Kong sends greetings with that most practical of second generation Vacheron overseas, the dual time in steel. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Okay, a uh, question from Mark S. Am I going to be on next Monday? I am. That's a work day here, so I will be on next Monday. Mark your calendar. Uh, right here, we've got a question from Multi D. Are brands like Blancpain, IWC Panerai, and others in trouble in America? I don't hear much about them. All of them sell. The only question is at what percent of retail price? Look, we sell a lot of used Panerai. It's one of our brisk selling brands. We have a lot of turnover. It may be that the pre-owned price for some of those watches is closer to the market carrying capacity. Since we're not an authorized dealer, and we haven't been for a while, I can't speak to how they're selling new. All I know is that the brand was in trouble when last we had it. And the way to sell them, and probably, if I'm being honest, to buy them, is going to be a few months or a few years used. So when people start talking like that, saying, I like Blancpain, but you know, I'd buy it used. I like IBC, but buy them used. I like Panerai, but don't pay the dealer price. That's a challenge for people who are selling these things new. And it is a sign of a weakening brand. That said, it's not a sign of low lower volumes because eventually all watches sell. The question is only at what price and through what channel. So I would say the brands could be stronger. Certainly with Blancpain, they have one of the best and most iconic dive watches in the market. I do think the time has come for the 50 Fathoms to step down from 45 millimeters to 40 or 41 and be more of a one-for-one -one rival to Rolex. But I, I also think that there is a problem in marketing when you've got a watch like that in the catalog in sizes from 38 millimeters up to the X Fathoms, which is the size of a fist, and you're having trouble selling the watches at list price, and people are saying buy them used. So are the brands healthy? I would say they're healthy enough, but they could be better. Again, if the gold standard is Rolex, none of them are there. I would also say with Panerai, I think the brand's best years were between 2000 and 2005. Every once in a while, they'll come out with something like the Bronzo, or they'll come out with the Olive Green Dials, or they'll come out with something like the original PAM 127, the Fiddy, and, and it'll be a rush of interest. The problem is, can you make the whole brand that cool when you've declared Panerai to be the everything to all people brand that sells women's watches, gold watches, grand complications, and frankly, too many watches, if we're honest. Panerai is a company making 15,000 watches a year, mostly sports watches, mostly steel, almost all men's styles, was a lot more interesting to me than what it's become. That said, there's still a lot of merit. The movements have never been better. I just say, remember, get the best price. Now, 
Let's talk about more New Year's resolutions. I see Lloyd Kerr joining in from Maryland in the U.S. Mid-Atlantic. Adam Crossfire agreeing that the Planet Ocean 39.5 is the best. We got a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to do my best to answer them, but the chat box is moving fast. I see Konsaliki joining in from Germany. Thanks for staying up late with us right here. And I have Love Watches USA saying make more popular Rolex watches and the issue will go away. Well, I guess that is always the short term answer. Sell every single one you can sell. In the long term, uh, I don't know. That doesn't sound like the Rolex way. They always protect their after sale prices. Okay, more New Year's resolutions. Okay, how about ones we can actually keep? Patek Philippe, a Nautilus bracelet that at least equals Omega or Rolex, please. Since 2012, to say nothing about Audemars Piguet and Lange and Vacheron, but since 2012, we've dealt with a Nautilus bracelet that's held together the way you would make a Tag Heuer circa 1995. Removable links fixed by pins and sleeves, which means you need a block and a punch, the cheap way, to size that bracelet. It's uncivilized, it's unbecoming, and it's inexplicable because previously, Patek built its bracelets the right way, with screws fixing removable links. And that's true whether it's steel or precious metal. So. The 5711 by itself is fine. Last year it got a new movement. There's nothing wrong with the style. Water resistance, thickness, loom, it's fine. It needs nothing itself. It's the bracelet. And this is not just about screw fixed links versus pins and sleeves. I want to go a little bit farther because Patek Philippe is the standard of reference in the watch industry. It is supposed to be something approaching the summit, the apex of all brands combined. Patek is supposed to be la doyenne and the lord of them all. So give me a micro adjustment clasp. That's a push button adjustment system on the Longa Odysseus. It is a mass produced system made in Ticino by Broliolo. Anyone can buy it. IWC did, Longa did, Glasuta Original did. Patek, come up with something like this. I know you can do it. You can build grand complications movements that have over a thousand pieces, you can figure out a way to do this and do it on the Nautilus. Also, I would say that realistically, give me a bracelet that incorporates some sort of quick release system. This is on the new Oris Aquas. And what's interesting about this system is that the watch itself doesn't change. The quick release is built into the end of the strap and the bracelet. And I think the Nautilus needs something like this. Give me a quick release that's built into the bracelet so previous owners can upgrade. Put it in the bracelet so that you don't change the proportions of the case, which are fine. That makes it easy now to snap off the Nautilus bracelet, snap on a leather strap, snap on a rubber strap. Patek, you already make those straps. The ability to interchange between them, change the look of the watch, would be a huge selling point. Frankly, I know you don't need it, but something about being the best requires being better than you have to be. And I realize your wait lists are year long for the 5711, but be better than you have to be. This quick release system would be universally lauded. I would also say that Oris proves you can do it on a $3,500 watch. So what's the excuse? Now, I want you to be ambitious. Think about individual removable links that you don't need tools to remove. Think about the smart link on Cartier's Santos. Now, I understand that this is deceptively simple. And Engineering that, both on the actual engineering and production engineering sides, probably involved as much work and investment as building a grand complication. That said, your Patek Philippe, this is a $32,000 watch. You can find a way to do something like that on the Nautilus. And if you can't, license it from Cartier. I'm sure they'd be happy to share. Okay, jumping into the box, we've got Ordinary 999 joining from Norway. We've got all sorts of friends and folks sounding off and the chat box moves so fast it is difficult for me to keep track. Mr. Valju, the 50 Fathoms bracelet, hands down superior in every way to every dive watch I've experienced. The soul, the character, and personality of the watch is simply spectacular. That's from Mr. Valju. And then right here, we've got Emily N. joining in from the Great White North in Canada. Emily, good to see you. She's active on the Tim Masso Facebook group. We've got Scott L. saying my $300 Zelos uses screws. Come on now. And I agree. Multi D. Hill, fix that darn bracelet, Patek. I feel like they did that because money had to go to grand complications. You might not be wrong, but to be honest, there have been two price hikes 
for the Nautilus over the last three years. And at least to me, you need more than just a marginally new movement. You need a fully re-engineered bracelet if you want to justify your reputation as above and beyond. You can sell every one you make, and I know that. But Patek, I understand you strive to be better, and I'm taking that at face value. Okay. Right here, we've got Keystar G60. Tim, I get the impression that the Oris Atelier 111 movement offerings have been overlooked by the market more than they deserve. What's your take? Uh, two things. We're talking about a family of movements that came out in 2014. Um, the 110th anniversary of Oris, they called it the caliber 110, and then there's the 111, the 112, the 113. They're all variations on the 10-day hand-wound caliber that was Oris's first new movement in eons. The main reason they've been overlooked, there are really two. One, they launched them mostly on dress watches, which basically wasn't what the market wanted, and certainly wasn't what people looked to Oris to provide. People looked to Oris for sports watches. So there was a little bit of a positioning issue. Initially, they were in dress watches. They should have been in pilot's watches immediately. Second, it's a manual wind movement. And while connoisseurs tend to like that, the people who are looking for the best deal are generally looking at Omega, Rolex, and Breitling, and then they get to Oris and they realize they cost less money. Then they realize that the caliber 110 costs about twice as much as they're expecting to pay for an Oris. Then they realize that unlike those other brands, the 110 and its derivatives are manual wind, which they think is uncool, as a lot of times these are people who are just getting into the hobby and they've been conditioned to expect that the big three brands, Breitling, Omega, and Rolex, are something like the best in the standard, and a manual wind movement seems weird. It seems like it has one less feature than the others, when in fact many believe that manual wind, especially with the display case back that results, is in fact a selling point. But the fact that Oris is often making a price-based pitch, is known for its sports watches, and the fact that, unfortunately, it, it's a manual wind movement. It's just made it tougher to move. But I would say that an Artelier 110 or 111 is the best half-priced IWC Portugueser ever made. If you compare it to that, all of a sudden it seems like a real buy and a bargain for what you're getting. That said, the new Caliber 400 should close the gap between what people look to Oris to find and what they actually get from Oris. An affordable, 10-year warrantied, five-day automatic movement in sports watches. And then right here we've got Luis Molina asking, what is your favorite 36 to 38 millimeter Alonga Unzona? Well, I, I would have to say that my favorite is probably the 1999 Emil Longa, the 1815 moon phase homage a Emil Longa. It was a gorgeous 35.9 millimeter platinum limited edition with a, I believe it was a 1,000 year duration moon phase complication. Absolutely gorgeous. Traditional dress watch grace. Three dimensional white gold stars and cabochon on the dial. It was poetic and that's the only way I could describe it. That is my favorite 36 millimeter longa. Now, independent brands. A resolution for 2021. Please, through all of this, just survive. I'm wearing the HYT tonight because I really dig it, but I also like the brand. Resence, I love you guys. Debatun, Chapek, Cabistan. All of these brands are participating in an incredibly small marketplace for the haute de gamme from tiny purveyors, and that is very competitive in the best of times. It reminds me of the somewhat oversubscribed independent shop hand-built bicycle scene here in the United States during the 2010s, the previous decade. It seemed every week everyone was coming out with a new vintage style beach cruiser or $5,000 handmade fixie or hand-welded titanium road frame and the sheer number of people making volumes of like 20 to 100 bikes for the same clientele who was into that sort of thing, it was just too much and there was a considerable culling of the herd. It also feels, frankly, a little bit like the supercar market in the late 1980s when it seemed like all of a sudden these things were everywhere from everyone and brands that had never even existed like Cizetta in Italy were churning out V16 500 horsepower 200 mile an hour supercars chasing money that within months would no longer exist. $800,000. The bottom line is by the late 1980s, the marketplace for those things had eroded, and by the early 1990s, it had collapsed outright. Ferrari F40s that were selling for a million dollars suddenly became $150,000 cars, and I worry that that's where the independent horology market is heading in 2021. At some point, the economy for the rest of the world becomes real in the luxury space. And with too many independent brands, at this point, all I want is for them to weather the storm and make it to the other side. So independent brands, I love you. 
please survive. I will do everything I can on this show to promote any independent brand. If you own an independent brand and you want to watch review on Watchbox Reviews or you want me to wear it on the show, I'm all for it. Guys, I want you to do well. Now, let's talk about the LVMH brands. Here is a resolution for them. Make more unique models, not a million variations of the same watch. That is the Zenith DeFi El Primero 21. And frankly, I believe they missed a couple. It devalues the model, it devalues the brands to do that many variations. Notice how Rolex doesn't do this? Like Rolex has a few core model lines, and while there are many ladies' datejust variations, the bottom line is there aren't 25 or more Submariners. So what to do? Pair back. We had fun, we made a bunch of them, but let's focus on having a few core models and only a handful of build-out variations per year. When we get to dozens, it's too much. And I'm sorry to say, even though it's managed independently, Bulgari is doing that a little bit right now with the Octo Finissimo series. Fantastic watches, but I've lost track how many versions there are of the Octo Finissimo automatic. So for the three watch group brands, Tag, Ublo, and Zenith, more unique models, fewer variations. And for Bulgari, please, don't chase your brothers down that rabbit hole. Now, Basel World and SIHH, they're gone. To them, I say merely, come back as something better in the next life. I do think the huge trade shows are done. That said, I think the regional shows are going to stick with us. And while they may be delayed, I hope that towards the end of this year, we start seeing reschedulings of watch time, New York and LA. Watches and wonders, whether in Shanghai or Miami or Geneva, if it's happening, I'm there. Watch time was always fantastic because it was a product-focused show for collectors. You could go in and see Grubel 4C and Debatoon, but you could also see Blancpain. You could also see the Omegas of the world. You could see the solo practitioners like Carrie Voodelainen, and then you could see the Richemont brands. It was fantastic. Shows like that need to come back. And I'm hoping that by the end of this year, we see Dubai Watch Week back on the schedule, either for 2021 or at least in 2022. They do it every other year. They did it in 2019. It would have been done this year. I understand if it can't be, but I want to at least see that gleam on the horizon. Please, regional watch shows, come back to us. Now, jumping into the chat box right here. Da -da -da. It moves fast. It is always hard to keep up right here. I've got Eric Nielsen say, Bulgari jumped the Octo Shark. Three variations would have been a good stopping point. I gotta agree with you a little bit there, or at least no more than three per year, please. And then right here, we have a comment from Wolfgang. No, no, Emily, bigger Octo Finissimo, please. Uh, Emily is pretty vocal about smaller watches. I don't, I don't think I blame her. I don't think I blame her, but I think the 36 plus millimeter size of the BVL 138 movement probably means the 40 millimeter Octo Finissimo cannot get any smaller. I would also say right here, 39, 39 chime, saying I always enjoy your car talk and parallels. Will I ever do a car review? I would love to see a collab with Doug DeMuro. To be continued. To be continued. I will be doing podcasts on timmasso.com, guys. And I think now is a good time to plug the Zoom cast that I'm going to be doing this Thursday, where we can talk about anything that you want. You want to talk about cars this Thursday, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. It is an open forum. There's a link in the description to sign up, and I want you to all join me. No limit on signups, but you got to be in it to enjoy it. And of course, it's going to be a lot of fun as I'm going to bring the best out of the Watchbox inventories. And this is no holds barred. It's a private forum. You can ask me anything, even if it's a bit ribald, even if it's a bit politically incorrect for the watch industry. Everything is on the table. Just don't record it. But yes, I will be doing car podcasts on timmasso.com, so be sure to check that out. Jumping into the box, also I can see comments about the Alango Unzona Odysseus. Peter K. saying, Alango Unzona Odysseus was also another watch I was considering. Well, I'm going to consider it next after we jump into viewer wrist shots number three. David D., Shares the Vacheron Constantin, traditionnel, self-winding, that he bought at Watchbox's office. Thank you for trusting our company, David. Lawrence L. and his Casio calculator unweight the unveiling of the Panin Farina Batista supercar, which, in case you're wondering, is electric like the watch and looks like this. 1,900 horsepower. Welcome to the future. Carl G. braves the waves in Milwaukee. Seriously, that's a bold man with his IWC Aquatimer Cousteau and Jet Ski. All right, 
John D. from Long Island sends this holiday-themed Cartier Roadster, his and hers shot. Car theme by another means. I love it, John. And Saad of Saudi Arabia shares his H. Moser and C. Pioneer Center Seconds over morning coffee. I love it, guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on this digital. Or, if you're like our man Lawrence, digital on this digital. Now, after you've given up entirely on New Year's resolutions, and let's face it, it's going to happen, the bottom line is fun follows. And there's nothing more fun to me than a new sports watch from Alanga Unzona. Alanga Unzona, here's a resolution for you. Give me a steel Odysseus on a rubber strap. This is the thing, with pricing to match, right now you can buy the watch two ways. You can get it in precious metal on a strap, or you can get it full steel on a bracelet. I think for the sake of pricing, and also aesthetics, it would be great if I could buy this watch on a strap, and not have to pay for the bracelet if I don't want it. It would also be nice if they came up with strap colors that are keyed to the dial of the steel watch. A blue strap would look fantastic. I think guys who already have the bracelet would buy that as an accessory. But most of all, there is a problem with the inelegant look of this watch on its bracelet. It, it's almost like those guys whose necks are exactly as thick as their heads and it's a little bit like disconcerting. Uh, there's not enough variation between the width of the case and the width of the lugs where it joins the bracelet. What do we need to do? Just put the watch on a strap. Because the new strap clad Odysseus that came out in early 2020 is easily the answer to our prayers. You don't have to change a darn thing or re-engineer the tooling for the bracelet. Just put it on a strap. Let me buy it that way with a $5,000 discount and we'll be square. Plus, you'll be there. That is a sharp looking watch. Please, Langa, make this happen. Vacheron Constantin. Mm. The oldest continuously operating manufacturer in Switzerland. 1755 was a long time ago. But here's the problem. In the modern era, 2010 was also a long time ago. And back then, your two-year warranty would have been sufficient. But today, people expect more. In this day and age, Vacheron and Patek are offering two years when Audemars Piguet is offering five. And hold on to your hats, Oris is now offering ten. All of which is to say, your watch is are better than that. I know that they don't need service more than five years interval. So why not make it five years? Rolex is five, Omega is five, AP is five. If you buy from a Blancpain boutique, it's five. Let's go with five. You want to be the standard of the industry? The new industry standard is five years of warranty. The watches are unimpeachable. I love them. I love them across the board. I prefer them in many cases to AP and Patek. But they've got to be backed by a company that shows it believes in its product. And a warranty extension is the easy way to do this. With synthetic lubricants, watches sometimes go 10 years between services. So five years is the bare minimum. And Vacheron. The 2016 Overseas Collection was a class-leading product, but nobody seeking to win business from Audemars Piguet and Patek Philippe can afford to stand still or rest on their laurels. It's time to consider a dive watch. Yes, AP has the offshore diver, but it's thick, heavy, and ungainly. Find a way to keep an overseas diver 12 millimeters thick or thinner, preferably based on the self-winding model, and you will instantly be the market leader. It will happen overnight. Please, Vacheron, make this happen. Jumping into the chat box right here, I can see Multi D saying Tim has two watches on. Do a collab with Doug DeMuro. You know what? I may have something to announce soon. I'm trying to make that happen. I am in contact. I would love to do a collaboration with Doug DeMuro. That said, I've shot 32 videos in one day. Doug, the gauntlet has been laid down. Of course, there were watches. OK, now right here, we have Blue Shirt Buddha saying, Watch Time New York was a fantastic show. I truly hope it comes back. Roger Ruger of Watch Time, I know you're out there. Please, make this happen. We miss you. Make it happen, buddy. And then right here, we have Justin D asking, Tim, how is Breguet stacking up against Patek and Alango Unzona nowadays? What are your thoughts on the tradition line? Maybe the new one with the retrograde date. Well, I've always loved the traditions. I always thought they were the best answer to the question, what does a modern era ultra luxury Breguet wristwatch look like? The Marine and the Type 20s, which includes the 21 and the 22, they date to a time before Breguet was truly an haute de gamme brand. Like during the 90s, 
You could find some very workmanlike finish on Type 20s and Marines. Today, Breguet is high luxury, and the 2005 to present Tradition line, which takes the best parts of a pocket watch and put them on the dial of a wristwatch, the Tradition is the best expression of what Breguet does. There's craft art, there's hand finishing, there's technological innovation and detail. If you look at things like the silicon overcoil or the free-sprung balance architecture, they're very impressive. There's free hand engraving. All of this, tremendous. And I love the 38 millimeter 7027. It is still my favorite. There are complicated versions of the Tradition, but I think go with the basic 38, maybe step up to the 40 millimeter, but I don't think you need the complications. I think what's there is already beautiful, and when you get down to the screws, the bevelings, the bridges, the train architecture, you see that a lot of the beauty of that watch comes the closer you get, which makes it the opposite of many watches, which become far less interesting as you get closer. So I love the tradition line. I do think that the sports watch lines have been crippled ever since the redesign of the Marine line two years ago. It's not what people wanted from a Breguet sports watch, and I found that the previous big dates have actually picked up as people have sought to buy those used and a few years old rather than pay the price of the new Marine line, which is both inelegant in design and not identifiably Breguet in its shape. So while I like the watches and I think they're built beautifully, I say the tradition is where you want to put your money. The brand as a whole has problems. If Longa has trouble with resale value and discounting, I would say Breguet in many regards has the same problems, only more so. First, because in spite of its name, it hasn't been very well marketed. And in spite of its status as the flagship of the Swatch Group, there hasn't been enough discipline about production, model variations, and pricing. So I love the product at Breguet, and I think it's competitive with the best in the industry. But in terms of style of the non-tradition, non-Type 20 models, I think they've got some ways to go. A redesigned mid-cycle might be in order for those watches. Think about some cars, like the Pontiac Aztec. Sometimes a design comes to market, and it's just so wrong for the market, and instead of waiting three, four years for the mid-cycle of the product for a redesign, they do it immediately. I think the Marine needs that. Okay, Kevin S. is saying CQ, Sequan from our own office in Dubai was awesome. We want to send Sequan back to Dubai. We want to do another Dubai show. We have a full-time shop uh, in the DIFC at Dubai, and uh, there is a Watchbox Dubai office whether or not Watch Week is running. So while Sequan might not be in the Middle East right now, definitely check us out. Questions about the two watches I'm wearing. One is an HYT, one is a Zin. The Zin you know well, the HYT is the H0. Let's jump back to our regularly scheduled program. This is for all luxury watch brands. Online and searchable archives of your past models and lines. Many brands offer archive extracts for a fee, and that's fine if you're looking solely for the build date of a specific serial number. But most of us trying to research a purchase are looking for more general information to make an informed choice. Now, most of these brands have enormous archives. They're not well organized in every case. Sometimes they're not staffed by a full-time archival staff or historian. But the bottom line is most of the data is there for most of these brands, at least going back 20 years, which is the modern era. Much of it is even in computer records. So what I would like them to do is start compiling information about models, production years, features, um, technical specifications, production numbers so we know how many were made. Basically, I'm glad that databasing efforts like watchbase.com and my own Watchbox reviews exist, but we're trying to reconstruct what already sits in the archive department at the manufacturers. Uh, this is invaluable data in history, and you know that because major auction houses bend over backwards to reconstruct even fragments of the story of old watches, that giving context adds a lot of inherent value. Uh, for me, for you, for journalists, for guys who are just getting into the hobby, the ability to go to the Breitling website and research a model that came out in 1992 would be a godsend. The fact that they already have the information means it should happen. Uh, I would also say that if you show that your old watches are worth documenting and remembering, others will start to agree. It's partly a public service and partly an investment in brand equity. If you show that it's worth remembering Blancpain watches from 1995, all of a sudden collectors and vendors and enthusiasts are going to start to feel the same way. History that's worth remembering has inherent value. Please help us to remember your history. All these luxury brands, create a portal on your site where I can put in my serial number, see when it was made, find out about what movement is inside, how many models were made, what year was it cataloged. 
Heck, make it so I can just enter the model name and get some of that material. Brands, please make this happen. Jean-Claude Biver, proper industry-wide recognition. This is not um, a resolution on his part so much. It's more of an acknowledgement that as an industry of enthusiasts, collectors, engineers, marketers, finance types, it doesn't matter what you do in this industry, we all owe this man a huge debt of gratitude for helping to bring it back. I'm not gonna lie, I've been a JCB skeptic in the past. Even as I recognized his huge achievements in the industry, despite his brilliance, friendly demeanor, and obvious enthusiasm, he was also an irrepressible marketer and pitch man whose extended legacy includes saturation level marketing, celebrity worship, and a sort of generic turnaround formula that ultimately led all the LVMH watch group brands to look like, well, duplicates of each other. Tag, Hublot, and Zenith all looked the same. I got to the point where I saw Biver as a sort of watch industry analog to figures like Carol Shelby and Stan Lee, who were giants in their industries, but ultimately generated a little bit of cynicism by over-marketing and claiming too much credit towards the end. I think the time to take that critical view of Jean-Claude Biver is over. I really think that at this point, two years since he stepped down from the presidency of the LVMH watch group, he hasn't looked as robust in public appearances and we haven't heard as much from him. I really think he needs more than his 2018 GPHG um, special jury prize. I, I think we really do need to celebrate him with something like a Lifetime Achievement Award, not just from LVMH. I want to see Swatch Group. I want to see Richemont. I want to see Seiko Epson. I want to see Citizen. I want to see every watch group in the industry. I want to see the independents, and I would love to see some sort of message from us, the collectors, to thank him, not just for bringing Blancpain back from the brink in the 80s, for reviving Omega in the 90s, for building Hublot back from basically a failed state in 2004, to rebuilding the tag watch brands. And as much as I disagreed with his marketing strategy, Zenith is stronger now than it's ever been. So this is the time to really show gratitude and express our thanks and acknowledgement. Again, the worst thing that can ever happen is that you say thank you too late. And JCB, he has earned thank you. Okay, wrist shots number four. Jumping into Bud D, presumably has Disney World all to himself these days, along with his Rolex Explorer. Nice shot, how was the ride? Raphael H. appears to be hunting for his next strap with his Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter. Very nice. That little guy in the background, he's about to become a strap. Mo S. and his Rolex Pepsi GMT take to the road and his Lexus GS350 F Sport. Eric N. forwards one more holiday shot and a bit of cheer with his Zinn 857 Aviators GMT. And Mehmet K. bids us farewell with a spectacular Mediterranean Rolex shot from Turkey. Outstanding. I think that one wins the art prize for tonight. All right, guys, watch collectors. I'm going to write, well, no, I'm going to change my mind. I was going to write about watch snobbery. I was going to write about social media feuding, obsessions with the same six or seven references from the same 2.5 brands and our inability to properly appreciate what we have. But I'm a badly flawed person who's been guilty of all of the above. For that reason, I would say as collectors, our resolution individually and as a group should be to each bring one new person into the hobby this year. Diplomacy always brings out the best in people. And if you want a, con uh, a counterweight to watch snobbery, to the notion that you might take your watch collection for granted or forget how much you have. Um, if you want to focus on watches you love rather than watches that sell or the Instagram sensation of the moment, try to engender that excitement in, in, in a friend. And if not a friend, take a stranger, someone from your office, get them into the hobby, bring in a member of your family, indoctrinate them. Like I said, bringing people into the hobby being diplomatic, explaining in the best terms what made you love watches is going to bring out the best in you as a collector. And each individually, it will bring out the best in us. So our resolution, bring one person into the hobby this year. Not only will it be the right thing to do, I think you're gonna have a lot of fun doing it. Guys, remember, link in the description, to sign up for the Tim Masso Zoom event this Thursday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. And remember, comment, subscribe, and check me out on Instagram, Tim underscore Masso. Guys, thanks so much. Thanks to you, Sean. Time out, Tim out. Happy New Year one last time, and thanks for logging on.